Hey, welcome to City Lights Home. Our mission is to bring light to your life so you can experience all that God has for you. I wanna give you a few pointers you can use to help you experience God today. First, if you have kids elementary age and below, we encourage you to grab a tablet, laptop, or your phone. Then go to wearecitylights.com. Right on the front page is a tab that says pre-K and elementary. Click on whichever age group is relevant for your kids and there they can watch a service experience that is geared towards them. Second, if you have kids in middle and high school, we encourage you to watch service together as a family. Third, engage with us online. Leave comments, feel free to sing, even shout down the preacher. Your engagement will increase your ability to experience God. Lastly, share today's service on your feed. This is an easy and effective way to invite your friends and family to church. Thank you for inviting us into your home today. Now here's the FaceTime question of the day. Time to show the world that top is what I strive for. Greatness is a journey I'm willing to strive for. Consistency is key and I don't take no time off. Against the odds, I put it all on the line for. A lesson learned for every flaw I'm gonna make. Consequence I undertake. Putting all my trust and faith. Failure won't become my fate. Ten toes down, I never fall. Give it all to reach my goal. That's my name is Stone, but my story's told. Say I did it for the... But what I know about you is chances are pretty good you're hoping that something will be different this year. How many of us would love to see something different in 2021? And I'm not just talking about like the end of the COVID days or the end of some of the complications we have seen in our country and beyond. No, I'm talking about a lot of you would probably like to see something different in your very own life. For example, some of you might be thrilled if you could become more healthier and lose some weight this year. Some of you might probably would love to pay off some debt this year. And some of you would probably love to grow closer to God. I'm guessing that almost all of you have some area of your life, like me, where you're hoping that something will be different this year. And perhaps you even have a goal of, of some type or some type of resolution where you're thinking 2021 is finally going to be the year that I'm going to accomplish this thing or stop doing this thing or whatever it may be. And maybe you even started out strong, but unfortunately, like so many of us, uh, you just failed relatively quickly. In fact, some of you this short end of the year, you've already forgotten you made a New Year's resolution. You're beyond the wall and you're in a lot of trouble. Why is it that so often we have such good intentions? We have such good intentions, but we find it so difficult to make the change in our lives. What we wanna do over the next three weeks is look very specifically at how do we choose what we're gonna call the greater reward the greater reward. And we're, we're gonna look today at a guy who I guarantee is going to encourage you. This man is the Apostle Paul. If you ever feel like you can't figure out why you do the wrong thing, believe me when I tell you, the, the Apostle Paul, he's gonna make you feel way, way better about yourself. Let me give you some context about Paul. If you don't know, he is a guy that experienced and encountered the risen Christ, literally experienced him. Here's a guy that God used to raise the dead. In fact, the Apostle Paul wrote one third of the New Testament. 
and as close to as God as he was and as impactful as his ministry was, he uh, said in Romans chapter 7, he said this, and it makes me feel so much better about myself. He said, I don't really understand myself. Did any of you, do any of you ever feel like that at all? He said, for I want to do what's right, but I don't. Instead, I do what I hate. He said, I want to do what's right, but I cannot. I want to do what's good, but I don't. I don't want to do wrong, but I do it anyway. He kind of sounds crazy, almost in a very endearing kind of way. And then he says this. He says, oh, what a miserable person I am. Who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin and death? Who can help me change? Who can help me be better? Who can help me do what I want? Who can help me stop doing what I don't want to do? Now we're going to hold the answer to this question, but the title of today's message is help. I am out of control. So Father, today we pray as we're launching into a new year that by the power of your spirit and the truth of your word, you would, you would help us to change to become more like your son Jesus. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Now, I'm excited to talk to you about a subject that I really believe can impact your life. But it's a subject that has really gotten what I like to call a bad rap. I want to talk about the gift of discipline. The gift of discipline. Now, the moment I say discipline, a lot of you like, uh, Isaiah, I'm just not a disciplined person. I don't want to work that hard, to be honest. I hate discipline. There are some people that are disciplined and I'm just not disciplined. Discipline has gotten a bad rap. What I wanna do is give you a very simple definition that helps you to see that not only is it attainable and achievable, but it's incredibly helpful in your life. And you can let God grow you in your discipline. What is discipline? A very simple definition is this. Discipline is choosing what you want most over what you want now. Very, very simple. Discipline is, uh, with the help of God, is choosing what you want most over what you want now. What's funny is, when you think about it, most of us, we kind of want similar things, right? In almost every major area of life, we want similar things, but the results are often vastly different. For example, those of you that, if you're married, Chances are pretty good that you want a marriage that's full of love and trust and intimacy. You want a strong marriage. Like, I don't know anybody that's ever said, you know, I want to be divorced four times by the time I'm 40. Nobody wants that. Everybody wants a good marriage. We want similar things. The same could be said with our health. Most people say, I want to feel good. I want to look good. I want to be healthy. They don't say I want to be out of shape. They don't say, my goal is when I walk up a flight of stairs that I'm out of breath. They don't say, I want to look awful on the beach. I want to look really bad in my swim shorts. Nobody says that. We want similar things. Even when it comes to our finances, what do people want? We want to be able to be a blessing to others. We don't want to have to worry about money. We want some freedom. We want to feel secure. Nobody says my goal is to be paycheck to paycheck for the rest of my life. No one says, you know what? I love fighting with my family over finances because I don't have enough money to do anything. So I tell them, you can't do that. I want to be bankrupt. No one says those things. So many of us want similar things, but we end up with tremendously different results. Why is that? We want the same thing, but we need to recognize Desires don't determine who you become. Disciplines determine who you become. Desires don't determine what you do. Disciplines determine what you do. In other words, hoping for a better life won't bring you a better life. Habits that honor God will bring a better life. Why is it that we want perhaps to be more disciplined, but we end up failing? Why is it that we try so hard, but we fall so short? One of the reasons is, is because willpower doesn't work. Willpower doesn't work. We think that it does, but it doesn't. Now, willpower is a lot like a muscle. Once you work it too hard, it becomes fatigued and its power starts to go. It gets tired. 
And you know this because you can have some willpower for a little while. Now, like say someone brings like some Krispy Kreme donuts to your office and, you, and you're trying to not eat sweets right now. And so you walk by the donuts one time with great confidence. I don't even need that chocolate covered sprinkle one that looks so delicious right there. Your willpower is strong. The second time you walk by that donuts, by the donuts, you say, I'm just going to get a little bit closer, just trying to, try to try to make sure no one's eating them all, you know, just try to make sure people are sharing with everybody. And then the third time you tell yourself, I'm just going to smell the donut. I'm just going to smell it. Mmm, smells so good. And the fourth time you think, you know, I'm just going to touch it. I'm just going to touch the donut. I'm not going to eat it. I'm just going to touch it. Make sure it's soft. Make sure the donut's soft. And then the fifth time you actually break it in half and you eat half of the donut. And then uh, like about 30 minutes later, you go back and eat the other half, but you count it as victory because you spread it out. You ate like half and then you ate half later. So you kind of didn't, yeah, you weren't being greedy. You were just, yeah. But anyway, willpower simply doesn't work. Throw that hot Krispy Kreme donut sign on, game over for me. I want the donuts, all of them. So what, what happens is willpower doesn't work for long because eventually it starts to fade which is a real problem if you're a follower of Jesus. Because think about it. If we're a Christian, what do we know? What do we know? We know we're supposed to do good and to honor God, and we're not supposed to do bad. We're supposed to do good. We're supposed to pray and read the Bible and be nice and serve and be generous, and we're not supposed to do bad. We don't lie, we don't cheat, we don't steal, and we don't yell at people at the store. We know we're supposed to do good, and we're not supposed to do bad. And so what do we do? We try with all of our willpower. I'm not gonna say cuss words. I'm actually gonna be nice to my kids. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm, and, and we try and we try, but eventually, guess what? Our sinful desires start to overwhelm our fading willpower. And what do we do? We give in. And without even knowing it, we look back and say, I took it, smoked it, touched it, clicked on it, bought it. I can't believe I ate the whole thing. Have you ever noticed right before you fail, before you give in and do whatever you didn't want to do, or you can't do what you want to do, before you fail, have you ever noticed how the devil will tell you it's no big deal? Don't worry about it. Everybody else is doing it. You're not hurting anybody. It's no big deal. Before you fail, have you ever noticed how your spiritual enemy tends to minimize the consequences of any kind of wrongdoing? But after you do it, what does that same voice do? That same one that minimized it then connects your failure to your identity and tells you, now you are a bad person. You are a spiritual failure. You will never amount to anything. You are pathetic. You are worthless. You will never ever change. You don't have what it takes. You can never be healthy. You can never be pure. You can never have a good marriage. You can never be financially free. Before you fail, your enemy minimizes it. But afterwards, he starts to try to connect your failure to your identity. This is so important. And why is it? Because the key to really changing starts with our identity. And I want, to t I want you to watch whenever the Apostle Paul was struggling the most. You can see the root of his problem in this particular dilemma when he defines his identity this way. What did he say in verse 24? He said, oh, what a miserable person I am. Another version, he says it like this. Oh, what a wretched man I am. Because I'm bad, because I'm pathetic, because I, I, I'm awful, I can't do what I want. I end up doing the wrong thing. And he enters into what I like to call a cycle of shame. Let me show it to you. Why is it that we have such a difficult time changing? Because fundamentally, oftentimes we believe I don't have what it takes. I am incomplete. I am pathetic. I'm bad. And so by nature, what do we think? We think we're bad. So what are we going to do? We're going to try really, really hard. I'm going to try. I'm going to try. I'm going to try whatever it is. I'm going to try to wake up early. I'm going to try not to hit this news button four times. I'm going to go to the gym. I'm going to do 10 sit-ups a day. I'm going to stop eating carbs. I'm going to stop spending more than I make. I'm going to stop being a rude person and I'm going to try to be more generous. And then once we try for a little while, we may have some success, 
but eventually our willpower fades and our own strength. We just don't have enough to get it done. And once our willpower fades, eventually we have some sort of inevitable failure. We sin, we lust, we lose control of our temper, we say the wrong things. And after our inevitable failure, what do we experience? Tremendous guilt and shame, which reinforces the belief that I'm bad, that I'm never gonna please God, and that I can't change. So what do we do? We try hard again to be something that we're not, but deep down, our distorted identity discourages us and disrupts our ability to become who God is calling us to become. It's the cycle of shame. And one day we wake up and think, you know, I just can't do it. I just can't do it. I really can never be different. Something's wrong. Something's not working. Something is not right in my life. Something is not right in my life. What I want to do is I want to try, try to tell you that it's not something that you're missing, but it's someone. It's someone. And that someone you're missing comes with power that you simply do not have. The Apostle Paul was wrestling through this distorted identity when he comes upon the truth and preaches to himself. He says, who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin? Who can help me change? Who can help me be different? Who can help me to honor God? He says then, then he answers the question and he says, thank God. The answer is in Jesus Christ our Lord. It is in Jesus Christ. It is the power that I do not have because he who, sets the, who the sun sets free is free indeed. And this is the key. It starts with identity. It's not all about behavior. And the root of this is, it's not about behavior modification. What we're talking about here is spiritual transformation. And oh, this is a night and day difference, believe me. I'm not gonna try talk about you trying to be a better version of you. It's about a power greater than what you have that changes you from the inside out and empowers you to become the person that God wants you to be. It starts with identity. Now somebody say that it starts with identity. Type it in the Facebook chat. It's in identity. So the devil wants you to think that you are what you did, that you are bad because you failed. Listen, you are not what you did. You are not what others say you are. You're not even what that own discouragement that condemns you in your mind says you are. Who are you? You are who God says you are. You are who he says you are. And if you're in Christ, he says you're forgiven. If you're in Christ, he says you're free. He says that there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. He says you are an ambassador of the Most High God. He says you're called and set apart. You have the righteousness of God and Christ dwelling in you. He says you can do all things through the power of Christ that gives you strength. When you know who you are, you know what to do. It's not, it's not a behavior modification. It's spiritual transformation and how you see the, the core of your identity when you become a child of God. You're not a better version of you. You're different. You're new. The scripture says the old self, that pathetic thing is gone. And behold, because of Jesus, all things become new. It's a transformation. You belong to Jesus when you, when you know that you belong to Jesus, when you recognize that you belong to Jesus. It's not just a Sunday school statement of, uh, yeah, I'm a Christian, blah, blah, blah. No, but when it becomes your identity that you belong to Jesus, it changes everything. If you have surrendered your life and declared him as Lord, you know that you belong to Jesus. You've been adopted into the family of God. You are a joint heir in Christ, with Christ. You belong to Jesus. So would you say this with me? Say it, I belong to Jesus. I want you to say it again and again. I belong to Jesus. Type it in the chat even. I belong to Jesus. Just say it again. I want you to like really bring this in. Just internalize it. And you don't even have to say it loud. Just say, I belong to Jesus. Close your eyes and just think about it in your mind. I belong to Jesus. He is my source. I belong to Jesus. He is my identity. I belong to Jesus. He is my strength. He is, my, he is, his power is made perfect in my weakness. I belong to Jesus. And when you recognize that you belong to Jesus, listen, 
You're no longer a slave to your sinful desires, but you're filled with the Spirit of God that gives you strength. It's the Spirit that gives you strength to choose what you want most over what you want now. Now, how do we do this like real practically? How do we live this out? Like it's not a church sermon time, but it's a Tuesday morning and you wanna be angry. How do we live this out? Well, the Apostle Paul said in Galatians 5.16, he says this, so I say walk by the Spirit. Now somebody say walk by the Spirit. Just say it, walk by the Spirit. Here's what we're gonna do. You're gonna walk by the Spirit. And when you do, when you walk by the Spirit, I like this, you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Now, what does that mean? You won't gratify the desires of the flesh. Well, the word in the Greek language is translated as flesh. It doesn't mean like your skin. It's the Greek word sarx. And it's used 147 different times in the New Testament. And what that means, what sarx means is it's your sinful nature. It's your sinful desires. And the Apostle Paul said somewhere else, we put no confidence in the flesh. In other words, we put no confidence in our willpower. We're going to walk in the Spirit, and when we walk in the Spirit, when we're faithful to the direction of God, when we're empowered by the Spirit, we will not, not by willpower, but by spirit power, we will not gratify the desires of our sinful fleshly nature. The word walk in Greek is from the Greek word peripato, and this is a present tense verb, and I like this. What it means, what it means, it's a present tense verb. It means continuous, regular action. It's just a habit-forming way of life. When you walk by the Spirit, it's not a one-time event. It's an ongoing way of life. What are you doing? I'm waking up and I'm depending on the Spirit. What are you gonna do? Well, I'm asking the Spirit to give me the words to say. I'm asking the Spirit to give me the wisdom to know what to do. I'm asking the Spirit to give me power to say yes to what's right. And I'm asking the Spirit to give me power to say no to what's wrong. It's not my power. It's not my willpower. It's the power of the Spirit of God in me, and I'm walking with the Spirit. I'm walking with the Spirit. I don't know if you've ever known, but Christians, you know, we sometimes have our own language. Christianese is what we call it. We like to say things like, well, how are you doing today, Bob? Oh, I'm blessed and highly flavored. Hallelujah. We like to talk like that, you know, but something we say that's actually very biblically accurate is, I'm gonna take a big step of faith. I'm gonna take a big step of faith. What I wanna do is I wanna encourage you to take a step of faith. Take a step of faith. Always take a step of faith. But don't just take one. Take a step of faith followed by another step of faith. Followed by a continuous action of depending on God. Another step of faith. And before long, once you've taken enough steps of faith, You're not living according to sight, but you're walking according to the Spirit daily. And this sounds almost crazy and undoable in the beginning until your identity is so formed that I belong to Jesus, that I just don't like to go to church to honor Him, but I need His presence every single day. Guide my steps, direct my thoughts, renew my mind, empower my words, use my life moment by moment by moment. It becomes a succession of steps when we're walking in the Spirit of God. And when you're walking in the Spirit of God, guess what? You don't obey the desires of the flesh. It becomes a spiritual habit that's born out of a spiritual identity. I'm walking with the Spirit of God. What's interesting, though, is this metaphor. Notice what Paul says here. He said you're walking. He said you're walking. He didn't say you're running. In other words, it takes some time to get there. The challenge with what you want now, the sinful desires, what you want now. Now, this is the challenge. The challenge is that with with what you want now, there's almost always an immediate payoff, right? That cookie tastes good now. Sexual sin feels good now. Sending that really mean, hateful, angry text or posting that thing on Facebook, it feels good now. The desires of the flesh always, almost always have an immediate payoff. But the greater reward, the greater reward, it almost always takes more time. What do you want most? A godly marriage? A spiritual legacy? Financial freedom? A meaningful ministry? The greater reward almost always takes time. It's walking by the Spirit, depending on God day by day, 
moment by moment. It leads you to the greater reward. So somebody say it with me. I belong to Jesus. I belong to Jesus. It breaks the cycle. It breaks the cycle. Instead of trying hard and then the willpower fades and you fail and you feel horrible and the cycle goes on and on. Instead, it looks more like this. I belong to Jesus. And because I belong to Jesus, I'm going to walk in the spirit. I'm going to depend on him. Listen to me. When I'm weak, and you're going to be weak. When I'm weak, his spirit, his history, he is the one who helps me. It's not religious talk. It's spiritual transformation. I depend on the spirit. And then when that happens, it builds my faith because I know that God is with me. And as I'm depending on the spirit, it builds my faith. Then what does it do? It empowers the right actions, which then in turn does what? Then in turn, it makes you closer to God and reinforces the root identity that I am his and he is mine. I belong to Jesus. His power is within me. Now, the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead, guess what? It dwells in you. It dwells in you. You can change when your identity changes. It's not behavior modification. Is genuine spiritual transformation and powered by the risen Son of God. Then suddenly, you're not shame-driven. Go to try harder, but instead, you're spirit-led. You're not trying to control your flesh, which you can't do anyway, but you're depending on the Spirit of God. And because we belong to Jesus, He's empowering us, empowering us to become more and more like Him. Now here's the key. We're not striving and living for future results way out there. Oh, when I finally get married one day, when my kids are finally behaving one day, when I finally lose 22 pounds one day, when I finally get my cholesterol down one day, when I finally pay off my student loan, we're not living for, for results in the future. We're living from an identity today. And identity drives actions, and actions create results. So what do we do? You wake up one day and you say, I belong to Jesus. Because I belong to Jesus, I'm not trying to read my Bible. I'm not trying to pray so much. I'm not trying to be a better person. No, because I belong to Jesus, I want to read his word. Because I belong to Jesus, I love spending time in his presence. And as I get to know him, it continually reinforces my identity and I'm becoming more like him. Hey, because I belong to Jesus, I want to honor God with my body. So I'm not trying to get up and go to the gym. I'm not trying to, you see, but because I believe this is a temple of the Holy Spirit, I choose empowered by His Spirit when I want most, what I want most over what I want now. Who am I? I belong to Jesus. I am a godly man who will be a godly husband. And for those of you who are struggling with lust, when you change your identity, I'm a godly person, Suddenly you realize, I don't need porn. That's stupid, it's fake, it's disgusting. When I, what I love is when I feel tempted, I'm empowered to make the right decision. And what I love, I love the freedom. I love the freedom of not worrying about being caught. And I love the joy of not feeling the guilt. And I love, I lo absolutely love the intimacy I have in, in the mirrors that's real and not just some mirage. It's who I am in Christ with God's help. And with God's help, by His Spirit, by His power, He's helping me choose what I want most over what I want now. That's why I call it, what I call it is the joy of discipline. The joy of discipline. And I know some of you may think, okay, Isaiah, sounds good. You know, you seem confident in this and you seem disciplined. Sure, it might be easy for you, but trust me, Trust me, I've come a long way and I'm still a work in progress. Now in my late teenage years, kind of even bleeding into my early adulthood, I was super shy and super insecure. And even though I met and knew Jesus, I often let my insecurities dictate my choices and my emotions. As a Christian, I try really hard to do what's right. And I try really hard to not do wrong. And I couldn't get it right because deep down inside, I felt I'm still unworthy. I'm still no good. But guess what I've learned? Over time, I've learned to speak positive things over my life, to help renew my mind on the truth I have in Jesus. I am loved by Jesus. I am secure in Jesus. I am disciplined. Now I speak these things because for years, guess what? I didn't feel secure. I didn't feel this love. 
For years I didn't feel disciplined. By faith, because of who Jesus is, I declare I am changing my identity. I am secure. I am disciplined. And so I say this, I, I say it over and over, I'm secure, I'm disciplined. It's Christ's power in me is stronger than the wrong desires in me. I am disciplined. Christ's power in me is stronger than the wrong desires in me. Listen, none of us have the willpower to, to become who we're supposed to become. None of us. Here's a little secret, and it's a life-changing secret. Self-control. Do you want that? Discipline. Self-control. Listen. You, you know what that is? You know what discipline and self-control is? It's the fruit. It's one of the fruits of the Spirit. It's a fruit of the Spirit. It's not the fruit of your own willpower. Now, Galatians 5 says this, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, faithfulness, gentleness. And what else does it say? Now, say it loud. Self-control. Self-control. It's a fruit of the Spirit. So what do we do? Just answer the question, what do you really want most? Like, like, please, don't play around. What do you want to be different? Name it. Like, whatever it is, just name it. What do you want most? Now, just what do you, not just what you want most, but even who do you want to become? Who do you want to become? And then wake up every day with the identity, true to who God says you are. You are new in Christ. You're forgiven. You've changed. You're an overcomer. And then moment by moment, you just learn to walk by the Spirit. Oh, I messed up. I confess it. I ask for forgiveness. Now, God, please give me strength for today. And I'm going to keep taking steps, learning to depend on God. And it becomes habit, step by step. I'm walking according to the Spirit. And I'm not gratifying the desires of the flesh. It's God's Spirit in you. God's Spirit in you helps you choose what you want most over what you want now. And that's how you change. Not by willpower, but by the power of the Spirit that dwells in you. Pray with me. God, we just, we just give you all the thanks. We give you all the honor. And God, I pray, God, that we just confess it even now with our mouths, Lord, that we belong to you. Jesus, that I belong to you. I am not with those negative thoughts, with the failures, and with, uh, with the, the, the condemnation that I constantly give myself. I am, not, I am not that, Lord, but I am who you say I am. I am loved. I am free. I am disciplined. So God, I pray now you just help us to walk in your spirit. Fill us, Lord. Give us godly confidence, not, not self-confidence. Give us godly confidence. God, that we can become more like you, that, that we make a daily choice to follow you, to, 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 to walk in your spirit. And God, give us grace when we fail and give us the, the strength to move forward. And it's in your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Well, amen. The Connect card should be popping up on your screen right now. And um, if you need some encouragement, like I know I could always use encouragement, uh, or if you just want to know more about the church, go ahead and fill that out and we'll make sure we connect with you. Also, we want to thank you so much for your generosity. Now, if you're new with us, do not feel any pressure to give. This service was a gift to you. Now, there are going to be ways that you can give. Pop it up on your screen now. Um, and when, remember, when you give, it takes you off the bench and into the playing field and we like having you out there so now we're about to enter into a time of worship so come on and sing with us he's coming on the clouds kings and kingdoms will bow down and every chain will break as broken hearts declare his praise for who can stop the lord almighty chains and every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb 
then every knee will bow before Him. So open up the gates, make way before the King. The God who comes to save is here to set the captives free. For who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles. And every knee will bow. This world, his blood breaks the chains, and every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb. Every knee will bow before him. Who can stop? the Lord Almighty Who can stop the Lord Almighty oh, Who can stop the Lord Almighty Who can stop the Lord Our God is the Lion The Lion of Judah He's wrong Chains in every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb. Every knee will bow before him. Every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb. Every knee will bow before Walking around these walls I thought by now they'd fall But you have never felt me yet Waiting for change to Knowing the battles won, for you have never felt me yet. Your promise still says, "Great is your faithfulness." Faithfulness, I'm still in your hands. This is my confidence. You've never failed me yet. I know the night won't last Your word will come to pass 
my heart will sing your praise again. Jesus, you're still enough. Keep me within your love. My heart will sing your praise again. Your promise still stands. Still in your hands, this is my confidence. You've never failed me
Thank you guys for singing with us. We'll see you next weekend.